Here are some of my observations when testing the Kemper with different signal generators. My test rig is an SSL Live console with this function generator at the moment, just outputting 1 kilohertz uh, test tone, sine wave test tone out of uh, Unity gain line outputs. And the operating level of the console is really important here, so it, I can determine what that is on this console. So I've gone for minus 20 dBFS equals 0 dBU. That just makes some of the mental arithmetic a little bit easier than minus 18 or minus 24 as we go through and try and work out what the values are. So I'm going to set my test tone signal to minus 34 dBFS. The reason I'm doing that is because we're going from a balanced line output into an unbalanced TS input, instrument input, and the grounding of pin 3 on that connection is going to lose 6 dB of gain in addition to what we're sending. So that would be overall minus 40 dBFS, which is a nice round minus 20 dBU hitting the input of the Kemper. I've got an RTA or spectralizer here and it's analyzing the signal coming back and I'm feeding it output master mono. As I turn the output level up, you can see that signal returning and the level that I measure here is minus 26 dBFS, which is minus six dBU. So just running through the Kemper, we are gaining uh, up by 14 dB. And that's on this flat profile with nothing enabled. So that would be expected really because we're going from instrument level up to line level. That's one of the duties this device performs. So if I wanted to trim that down to, if I wanted Unity gain through the system, I could go to minus 14 dB on the output control. And if I look at it now, yep, I'm getting bang on minus 40 dBFS, which is minus 20 dBU. So that's good to know where Unity sort of is. It's just shy of 12 o'clock on the control. So let's have a look at the other output level controls we've got. Here's the minus 12 in effect. And yep, sure enough, I see that drop by 12 dB. I'll just go back to, up to the, the full minus 26 dBFS signal again um, on the output control. So as I switch this in, I'd expect to see it to go to minus 38 dBFS, which we do. There it goes. So that's minus 18 dBU. Um, a useful figure to know. The reason I mentioned this output control is that if I go to Guitar Plus Processing as the feed point, first of all, notice that we're 3 dB down from where the main output level is. So there's a little bit more headroom at this point in the processing path, I guess, for switching other processes in. A little bit more headroom. Makes sense. But if I switch the minus 12 now, it's important to note it's not a minus 12. It's a minus 6. So this digital trim is uh, not always minus 12. That's important to know, I think. And it means two things to me, really, uh, that um, it's applied in two different points in the signal path. So two lots of minus 6 dB. And it's therefore a digital trim on a button. It's not something like an analog output pad after the DAC stage. We also have a bug here. I'm running 7.4.1. I found that the switching of this minus 12, or really at this point minus 6 uh, attenuation, is really unreliable. Activation deactivation requires a few cycles of this button in order to actually action. You can see it trying to do something on those meters in the bottom right there. It gives it a little blat and, um, before the DAC, so that's just not working properly. And it's only when the feed point is set to Guitar Plus Processing. Every other feed point I've tried seems to work effectively. So let me know if you've noticed that as well and whether you're getting the same results on the Kemper stage or toaster or rack on 7.4. So if I set the output to Guitar Studio in the manual that quotes this as being a much higher level, so we'll see we're back up to the same output level here as main output, which is minus 26 dBFS or minus 6 dBU in analog terms. Uh, it's the same as the stack and it's the same as master mono, left, right, and stereo. If I go back to uh, Guitar Studio, this is with the minus 12, supposedly minus 12 switch, but it's another 6 dB reduction here. So obviously Guitar Studio is only affected by the first bit of that attenuation, the same as Guitar Plus Processing. So um, if I shuffle the feed point along to the stack, you'll see it drop another 6 dB with that switched in. Uh, so it's minus 12 dB at the stack onwards. So let's do some tests with the stack switched in. So here's the amp. Here's what happens to a test tone signal. It's a guitar amp profiler, so it's going to add harmonics and harmonic distortion. Here we can see those in the high frequency range because I'm not generating anything below 1K. Now, if I switch in the cab as well, we'd expect to see that shape the signal and particularly in the high frequencies and the, the low frequencies, which we can't see in here. And there you go, those harmonics are 
shaped, attenuated in different ways and filtered. Right, let's change the signal source. I've now got pink noise as my source, and this is what pink noise looks like on a, on a meter like this. Uh, it's a randomized signal. It's a non-contiguous signal. So let's switch in the amp section. And here you can see there's boost and attenuation and filtering and so on going on. And again, if we switch in the cab here, we'll see more of an effect on the highs and the lows. It'll be more obvious with this test signal. And um, yeah, that's where the magic happens. Lovely. I'll just take those away again so we're flat. And I'm going to do a bit of a, let's call it a, some sort of signal integrity test. It's not an exact science or anything, but it's good to look at the overall signal preservation for the full frequency bandwidth through the Kemper and you know that takes into account phase coherency as well. I've got my control signal we know that this is 14 dB below the Kemper so I need to match the signal levels and I'll do that with the output control on the uh, Kemper itself so here's here are both at the same time and uh, I'm going to just attenuate that down so there it is, and once we've done that, we can um, subtract the two signals from one another, and we can look at what's left. Here we have, I'll just offset that again. So here we have evidence of some sort of low frequency drop off a little bit, like a, a really small amount. And the discrepancy in the high end, I'm going to put that really down to the um, uh, just the tolerance of the system. There's nothing massive going on here. There's no sort of wild kind of... Um, phase cancellation going on. There's no wild sort of attenuation and, and uh, boost of certain frequencies over others. So this is nice and flat. All right, if we switch in the amp and cab, you can again see those same sort of shapes happening to the signal response. Let's move on. Let's have a look at latency. So we need to stick with our pink noise signal. That's a non-contiguous signal is essential. Um, the analyzer won't be able to tell a sine wave cycle apart, regardless of whether it's cycle 1 or cycle 50. So here we are looking at a transfer function analyzer. And straight away you can see it's measuring a particular latency. I was playing with this earlier, 4.927, uh, but that was with constant latency. So I'll just deactivate constant latency and just replug this so it takes a new measurement. And we can see we get a value of 2.5 milliseconds, which is really quick. That's good, uh, considering that it's going to be doing plenty of processing. Now, consider that we could be hooking our Kemper up to a digital console like this. It has its own ADC stage. It needs to run through the DSP, process the signal on input, process it on output, back to foldback, and then go back through the DAC stage. So that has its own latency in the path. Um, this case, this SSL console is really quick. It's less than two milliseconds, especially when running at 96K internally. And um, that means that we are sort of, you know, under five milliseconds total round trip latency fully processed back to IEMs, which is really good. So it's nice that the Kemper is low latency like this. It gives us a little bit of room to play with if you're hooking up to a console that isn't quite so quick or another system that has more um, analog and digital conversion in the path before it gets back to you. Now with constant latency enabled we're up to this sort of just shy of five milliseconds that's still plenty low enough for for what we need most of the time but i would be uh less encouraged to run it at that personally so if you can reduce the latency anywhere in your complete signal path then and there's no penalty for quality or anything then then do so as we switch in different processing blocks in this case uh, pure boosters you'll notice that the latency value isn't changing in this test which is good because i'd I'd not want the latency to change based on just the in-out state of different processing blocks. If someone was trying to compensate for latency in the system, uh, specific values are needed, and just switching stuff on and off, changing that value would, would upset some engineers. With the constant latency on, obviously same result. It would be hilarious if, uh, if that changed with these being switched in and out on that setting, but of course it's still at its 4.927 millisecond value that I'm getting here. Talking of other tests that I want to do in subsequent videos, I need to measure the output impedance, which will involve measuring the voltage with a known resistance and without that resistance, and then applying some horrible maths to it, um, which I'm sure we can do. Um, but if you've got any other suggestions for things you want me to try and try and test out, then please do let me know uh, on the forum or in the comments section. Thanks very much. Hope it's been useful. Bye for now. <laughs>